Direct from the Ed Bernstein Show archives, things get wild when Ed interviews zoologist Jack Hanna. But first, Ed monkeys around with anthropologist Jane Goodall. Hang on, we're traveling back to 1995. Welcome to our show today. I'm Ed Bernstein. And my very special guest today is uh, anthropologist uh, Dr. Jane Goodall. And Doctor, welcome to our show. Thank you. You know, I know you've told the story before on National Geographic and some other television shows, but I wish, it, if you maybe if you don't mind repeating, how you got interested in animals at a very young age. Well, I, I just was apparently born fascinated by animals, and one of the earliest things that I, I remember is when I was about four and a half and I was staying with my father's family in the country and one of my jobs was to collect eggs. Well, you know, an egg sort of that size and where's the hole big enough on a hen? Nobody would tell me, so I waited and waited and waited and waited in a hen house. My family called the police, dusk was falling and I was rushing back to the house all excited because finally I'd seen this wonderful thing and my mother, instead of saying, how dare you go off without telling us, don't you know how worried we've been? Don't ever do it again. She saw the excitement, she sat down to hear this story of how a hen laid an egg. So that my mother then encouraged all my dreams. And by the time I was eight, I was dreaming of Africa because I was in love with Tarzan. And I thought his Jane was a wimp and I was real jealous. <laughs> and I thought I'd made a much better mate for Tarzan myself. And all her friends would say, but you don't have any money and you know in those days Africa was a whole other world with poisoned arrows and drum beats at night she used to say to me Jane if you really want something and you really work hard and you take advantage of opportunities you'll find a way if you never give up and you found that way working for uh, Dr. Leakey that's right I saved up money as a waitress got out there met Louis Leakey and he took me out to where he was searching for the fossilized remains of early humans and there he realized that I was somebody who really wanted to be with, in the wild in Africa. And this was about 35 years ago? Yes. And what was it like for a young woman at that time to, I mean, did you go alone to Africa? I went alone on yeah. my first trip when I met Louis Leakey, mm -hmm. when he eventually found money for me to study the chimps. And it took a while because I was untrained, I mean, academically untrained. Mm -hmm. The British authorities in what was then Tanganyika said, a young woman on her own in the bush? No. So I had to have someone to accompany me, and who volunteered Tarzan. for three months? My mother. <laughs> there was no Tarzan. Better, they're more protective than Tarzan. Well, she was amazing. She set up a clinic. She gave medicine to the local people. She established good relations, which have persisted right the way through. In, uh, at that time, it was kind of a, uh, well, a controversial call, I guess, by Dr. Leakey to put you in charge of that, that study. Well, people thought it was, for one thing, amoral because I was young and untrained, and two, scientifically not appropriate. What did he see in you that led him to feel that you were the person for the job? I think he saw a passion, a dedication. He realized I didn't care about hair and parties and clothes and boyfriends and that I wanted to live in the bush. He'd seen me out on the, on the plains and I met rhinos and I met lions and I was excited rather than scared. And once you started working with the, uh, with the chimps, you made an incredible observation of them using tools and, and, um, and I guess being self-sufficient in, in a certain to a certain degree, or to a large degree. What, how did you first notice that? I and mean, what was the first t sign that you had that you put together what they were doing and, and what the conduct and behavior was? Well, you know, first of all, they ran away when they saw me, even in the distance. And they gradually began to piece together their behavior because I found a peak, I had binoculars, and I sat there. Gradually they got used to me, and gradually I could get closer. And then one day, there was this male chimpanzee, and I could see he picked, picked little stems, and he was pushing them into a termite mound and picking the insects off. And I could hardly believe it. When he picked a leafy twig and stripped the leaves, in other words, he was making a tool, yeah. I sent a telegram the next day to Louis Leakey, and he made his now famous remark, 
that we must now redefine tools, redefine humans, or accept chimpanzees as humans, because in those days, we were defined as man the toolmaker. That was the one behavior that was said to separate us more than any other from the rest of the non-human animals. What other types of tools do uh, chimpanzees use? They use, at Gombe National Park, where I've been all these 35 years, they use long sticks to fish for these vicious biting driver ants. They put it down in the nest, and sweep the ants off, gnash them up. They use sticks to open bees' nests or to investigate something in a hole that they dare not put their hand in, sniff the end. They use leaves to wipe themselves or to crumple up and push into a little hollow in a tree where rainwater has gathered and suck it out. Uh, they use rocks as weapons. They use sticks to intimidate and various others. And then in West Africa, they use rocks as hammers and anvils to crack open hard nuts. And the thing is that everywhere where chimps have been studied, there are different tool-using behaviors, different cultures. Oh. So it's very similar to the way that yeah. humans really evolved in yeah. different parts. Uh, and also I read that, that, uh, that you observed them medicating themselves. And yes, well, there have been various studies. In fact, mm -hmm. everywhere where people have studied uh, chimpanzees, they actually use the same medicinal plants as the local people use. And they're kind of thought to be, nobody, I mean, it's still being investigated, but they're thought to be broad spectrum antibiotics, or in some cases, very rough, hairy leaves that, as they go through the gut, are thought to remove the eggs of internal parasites. Now, you have various um, programs that you're involved with, a Roots and Shoots program, and. Uh, and uh, the Jane Goodall Institute for Wildlife Research, Education, and Conservation. What are involved in some of these programs? Well, the um, Jane Goodall Institute, the JGI, is the umbrella institution that is responsible for raising money to carry out our projects. And there's a JGI, the main office in, in our Connecticut. But also we have offices in the UK, in Germany, in Tanzania, a couple of other African countries. And starting in Germany and Japan. The central, the sort of heart of the whole thing is to maintain the research on these chimpanzees in Gombe. Mm -hmm. And we're doing some little research projects in other countries too. Then caring for chimpanzees whose mothers have been shot by poachers, either for meat or for the live animal trade. And that's expensive, that's one of our main draining costs is caring for orphan chimpanzees in Africa. How serious is the population problem, chimps? It's declining extremely fast. There's thought to be no more than 250,000, maybe 200,000. And that's, I mean, that's fewer than in a small American town. And that's spread across 21 countries so that many of the remaining chimps are in small, fragmented, isolated populations genetically separated from other chimps and basically doomed. And how does that compare to when you first started um, observing chimps? There were hundreds of thousands, we don't know, but the turn of the century there must have been more than a million. But the forest has gradually decreased mm -hmm. due to logging and due to human overpopulation. So, chimps, uh, I know that you have stated they have emotions. What types of emotions have you really observed in chimps? Well, it seems that they have more or less the same as us, mm -hmm. joy and sorrow and fear and despair. And certainly we realize from studying the chimps that we humans are not only beings capable of rational thought, capable of suffering mentally as well as physically. Chimpanzees can plan for the future, the immediate future. They can, um, they can pass on information through imitation and practice. So they do have a sense of time then? They have a sense of time. And, and it, it's, it raises a lot of ethical issues. It blurs the line that used to be considered sharp between humans on the one hand and non-humans on the other. And it makes one extremely concerned about the ways we abuse and so many other of the amazing non-human beings on this planet. We're very arrogant. 
do, is it only chimps that you feel have these type of emotions and sense of time? No, I knew, yeah. th I knew that, that animals had emotions long before I studied the chimps. My dog had emotions. Mm -hmm. If you have a dog, your dog has emotions, right? Oh, oh yeah. And cats. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. just that science has, has rejected this because it's very hard to prove emotion. But I'll turn to any scientist and say, all right, you prove to me that they don't. Why must the onus be on me or you? Why can't the scientist prove that they don't have these things? They can't. Speaking of science, um, I guess there's a dramatic difference in the type of uh, mechanisms you use to study chimps today compared to 35 years ago. We have DNA, we have uh, computers and things like that. How has that made a difference in, in assisting you? Well, the DNA fingerprinting, you can actually um, work out paternity by collecting hairs, you get the hair follicle, and have it DNA fingerprinted. Or you can even collect it from feces, which is actually easier. And so we can begin to work out precisely the paternity of the different infants born, and we know better the relationship between the different members of the community. And then, of course, the, I mean, this explosion of technology that's led to the computer age, um, that's going to make the analysis of the data hugely more easy. You've been a, 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 a very verbal in your opposition to uh, having uh, chimps as pets. Um, how do you feel about zoos? Well, there are zoos and zoos, and you know, there are some zoos that should be immediately closed. They're terrible. They're the small cages with a couple of chimps bored to, to death and with nothing to do. There, on the other hand, there are zoos that now allow chimps to live in reasonable groups with a lot of space, with an enriched environment. And while it's better if they're in a situation as at Gombe National Park, where we still are, if you look at what's happening to chimps across so much of Africa, they're living in terror. There's, their trees are being cut down, they're being hunted, shot, and there are snares all over the place. Why are they being hunted? They're being hunted for meat. They're being hunted for the live animal trade. How do you feel about um, eating meat, non-chips? I mean, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, are you eat. a vegetarian? Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, I am. I've been a vegetarian for, I don't know, 15, 20 years mm -hmm. now. You feel the same way about fur and clothing? and? Well, the, the thing is that it's not so much the eating of meat per se. Mm -hmm. It's the intensive farming, it's the conditions in which we maintain the animals. You know, and I mean, if I were starving on a desert, I'd probably try and catch an animal to eat it to keep myself alive, mm -hmm. just as the animal would catch me. That seems to be not too terrible, but to keep a, I mean, an animal like a pig that's as intelligent as a dog in a, in a pen where it can't move around, or a veal calf, or a chicken. I mean, I know hens and they're, Fantastic. They gave me my first lesson in animal behavior, after all. And it's just not right. What has been your most unforgettable moment in studying chimps? Well, there are so many unforgettable moments, but I suppose out of all of them, the time when I held out a palm nut to David Grabier, that wonderful male who was the first one to let me come near, and he held out your hand, Hold out your hand. He had a palm nut. This may be my most unforgettable <laughs> moment. <laughs> well, I had the palm nut on my hand, mm -hmm. and he took it. He didn't want it. He dropped it, mm -hmm. but he gave me a very gentle pressure. A little squeeze. And it was, mm -hmm. it was a communication without words. I don't want the nut, mm -hmm. but it's okay. It's, I understand why you gave it. It was a reassurance. Is he still alive? No, he's been gone long, 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 long. Did, when you went to, to Africa, did you, did you know any of the language? No, I had to learn some Swahili, yeah. Key Swahili. And, and what do you, how many do you speak now? Only Key Swahili and so. chimpanzee, that's about it. I can't, <laughs> I'm very bad at languages. Did, but there is a chimpanzee language that you do speak? Well, it's chimpanzee communication through, through um, vocalizations. It's not really the same as, to me, human language. But yeah, I can understand that. So if, if you come too close to me and I'm eating, oh, oh. I mean, it's obvious, Oh, I get, it? Yeah. <laughs> I get that <laughs> all the time. If I'm a little infant yeah. who's lost its mother or who's wanting to suckle and she's rejecting me.
to thank you very much for your time. I want to thank uh, Clark County Community College also, and um, and good luck. And and you will. I should I guess give out your telephone number. Please. Please. Right. One eight hundred four nine two. Five nine two. There's a five nine two. I'm glad you were here to correct me. Five nine two, J A N A Jane, and that's the Jane Goodall Institute for Wildlife Research, Education, and Conservation. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Okay. Well, I've been looking for a way to, uh, to increase my hair, Jack. <laughs> well, there's a good piece. There's a good hair piece right there. It's a palm civet from Asia. Oh, he likes your hair. He, he likes, well, what's left of it anyway. <laughs> but what, what exactly well, palm um, is palm civet? Cat. It's not really a cat. It's a, what, what families is in? Mongoose. Mongoose family. And this is Susie Rapp. Hi, and Susie. I'm going to let her Hi. hold it, too, because I'm allergic to it. Can you imagine that? And they, they live in trees. They have a prehensile tail. He'll just climb uh -huh. on okay. you. Okay. And they have a prehensile tail. And eat like little birds, eggs, insects, that kind of thing. Prehensile, which means they have a fifth leg or fifth arm. A fi and what do they do with that uh, fifth leg or Just arm? Just hang in trees and look for eggs and monkeys and birds and everything. Now, how rare are these? They're not that rare. No? No, they're not kernel. Uh, they, they like microphones? He's going to be real rare if he gets electric. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susie. Oh, thanks, Susie. Well, let me ask you about, uh, it seems that you always have such a, a wide variety of, uh, of animals that you're, you're bringing on the television right. shows. So what are some of the factors you use in, in choosing the animals well, that, that you go all, put? All the animals we use have to be animals that have been raised by, by the keepers or either an orphan or the mothers don't raise them. And about 90% of them we put back with the mothers or with the group once they're older. So we use them for education. Uh, these animals are used to lights, noise, whatever it might be. And our, our belief is that the more we can expose people to wildlife, the more they'll understand to save wildlife. You know, you see a picture is one thing, or to, 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 to see a TV show is one thing, but to see something in living color when I bring it to, to, to shows is, is different. And, and how do you feel, I mean, where, where are we environmentally with, with, with uh, just the culture in America? And is it getting better in protecting right. wildlife? I don't, I don't know how old you are, but my generation, which we're about probably the same age, did more damage to the planet than any previous generation on Earth, our generation. The kids today are absolutely doing a tremendous job because of computers, and they're, they're so wise today compared to what we did. They're, 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 they're recycling. They know about our resources. They know that the resources are gone of water, air, forest, then the animals don't have a place to live, then people die. So right now, I'd say the generation coming up today is going to help save the planet. And it seems like there's a lot of more um, educational programs being taught in the schools. Yeah, when we started our TV series nine years ago, Animal Adventures, there were two other shows. Today there's 16 other shows in the animal shows. So yeah, more and more, coming Discovery Channel, National Geographic, our show, it goes on and on and on. The Crocodile Hunters, so many people are exposed to many different aspects. What do you think it is about animals that so fascinate children? You know, I was asked that question, what is it about animals that have been fascinating mankind since the beginning of mankind? You know, I... Uh, I, it's, it's, I don't know if, if, we, if we relate to animals. You know, some people like to relate to animals they think are like them. Uh, I always, one thing upsets me when somebody says, you know, in Rwanda, for example, when they had the massacre in Rwanda, they said, oh, those people are acting like animals. Well, animals wouldn't do that. Animals, think about it. Animals take care of their young. You have very little family abuse with animals. They don't waste food. Uh, they don't kill each other. They, they, they actually, we can learn a great deal from animals. And, and so I think we can... That's the answer to your question. I think we can learn from animals, and people are just fascinated by, by where animals live. And what is the, one of the best lessons that you've had from animals? Uh, respect. I think the, the best lesson you have with a wild animal, especially even domestic animals, is you have to respect that animal. Where it's from, what it, when you go to its home, and I go to Africa, or I just got back from Israel, or wherever I go to, I respect that's their home. It's not my home. And if, as long as you respect an animal, you'll enjoy it, and you won't get hurt. Has there been a place in the world where you haven't been that you're oh. still waiting to go to? Yeah, um, let me see. I, I've been all over China. And I, more, in, in Burma and Sumatra is where I'm trying to go this year. I have not been there. Everywhere else, the North Pole I've been, the South Pole, uh, all over Africa, er, everywhere. Australia, Asia, you know. But that's about two places left. And, and then I'll hang it up. And, and what you, <laughs> you'd be hanging from a tree. Yeah, but <laughs> right, right. What, what is your favorite habitat? Boy, uh, that's a good question. I love Alaska. I love Botswana. I'm getting ready to go back to Botswana in South Africa. Uh, I love the Himalayas way up. In, in, as a matter of fact, this cat right here, this cat right here is from uh, uh, Burma and Sumatra. Gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, it, it's the only cat that lives in trees about 90% of its life. Its coat's valued at $80,000. It's almost extinct, maybe less than 100 left in the wild. And probably only two people in the world have ever seen one. And now we have a few thousand more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs>
So preserving an animal like this is uh, is a difficult task. Yes, it's very difficult. Yeah. yeah, it's very very difficult because if we were to preserve this animal for the next 50 years, it would cost. For example, the tiger to preserve the tiger to the year 2050 will cost all the zoological parks in the world 58 million dollars at today's dollar. Thank you, Susie. Beautiful animal. So well, that fun. tells you that's just one animal. I mean, how much does it cost to take care of the elephant species until then? You're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. And who's doing the best job in our country, zoological park? Oh, no, they're, they're all, of them, all of them have done a great job. The American Zoo Association is, you know, you've got Columbus, Ohio, where I'm from. You've got Cincinnati, St. Louis, San Diego, uh, 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 Atlanta, uh, Milwaukee, Bronx. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Every zoo, you know, these animals are treated better in zoos than they are people are treated. Everybody says, I don't like a zoo. Well, they don't know much about the wild. 99% of our animals in zoos come from other zoos. They don't come from the wild. So, you know, they, they have it made. I hope that I can retire in a zoo. <laughs> well, I'm sure there'll be a job there for you. <laughs> Jack Hanna, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for okay, coming thank by. You. Is it true that kangaroos do box? Oh yeah, the big ones. The big ones can box. It's more of a defense mechanism. What uh -huh. you have to watch out for is that back. Look at the back foot on the bottom. See right. That claw there. Okay, I need to move that, over that here. That claw can, can rip you apart. <laughs> so what I want to do right now is, is show you how the kangaroo hops. So what we're going to do? If y'all can, run, I'm almost in the kangaroo. If you can move over, come here, Pogo. Pogo, come here. Come here. Oh, look at that. Look at that you don't have to go to Australia to see a kangaroo, do you? Right here at Napti. And how did you know to come to you? Well, of course, he's not doing very well, but You know, I think I called him the wrong number, wrong name Pogo, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It, 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 looks like, it looks like he'd be uh -oh. named Pogo. Uh-oh, Doug, boy, he gets away. We've got problems. He's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 you got to be careful. Because if a kangaroo gets away in here, I can, it'd be hard to catch him. Good job. How, how long How long do they, get, do they go before they run out of energy? No, he could go. You won't believe this. Uh, we did the Rose Bowl parade and okay. stuff, and he got going. He went about a half a mile before we could get him. Wow. They go 30 miles an hour. 30 miles an hour. Yeah. Hopping. This is a marsupial. This is uh -huh. a big red kangaroo. And David Jackson's raised him since a baby, and he just came out of the pouch, believe it or not. And the, the tail is used for balance. Do you, you know what you call a baby kangaroo? A roo. No. <laughs> a joey. A joey? And, and a right. group of kangaroos is called a mob. M-O-B, uh -huh. mob. So now you know as much as I know. <laughs> and how big will this kangaroo get? Well, this thing will get about, you know, five to six feet tall. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Jungle Jack Hanna. For over 20 years, Jack Hanna has been introducing America to amazing animals. Now it's Jack's turn to take control of the camera and do it his way. Yeah, I'm okay. It's my pride. Maybe I better go over and check this out. All the way. To meet the world's most incredible creatures in their native environments, Jack Hanna is going into the wild. But he's not going alone. Jack's sharing this adventure of a lifetime with his friends, family, and crew. Jack, you're more coordinated than that. You can't show, you this can't is X-rated. No, it's not X-rated. Yeah. Uh, I blew it up. Here. You can't put that on TV. <laughs> Unscripted. Now where'd the engine go on that boat? Unrehearsed. You have life jackets? And totally unpredictable. Ah! <laughs> Jack Hanna's Into the Wild will go places no animal show has gone before. You have a new uh, TV show, right? Yep. Jack Hanna's Into the Wild. Right. And how does that differ from what you've done in the past? Well, it differs a lot from the standpoint. When I say reality, I'm not talking about we're trying to, 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 to be reality, jump on animals, that type of thing. We're uh -huh. taking my family in to see the animals, a lot of the crews involved. We have three cameras involved, high definition involved. Uh, it's 60% animals, 40% the culture of the people. We just got back from Rwanda, as you know, which had the terrible genocide. And, uh, and, and did a story there about the peoples, how they're recovering and how the animals are recovering. So it's a, it's really a, a story, a, a, a series that's much different from the standpoint of being fun and really a lot of reality involved. When you go into a, a country like Rwanda, uh, do you find that the people are more or less sensitized to the animals in their region? I mean, Well, when, when, when you go into Rwanda, that's a, a very good question for Rwanda. The last thing the people are worried about are the animals, some of the people there. But what we're trying, trying to do they're now, trying to survive. Exactly, they're trying to survive. But President Kagame, the new president of Rwanda, democratically elected, is incredible with conservation. Uh -huh. uh, he's got all the parks uh, on the borders uh, controlled right now where the, where the refugees can't come in and take the land. He realizes the number one asset he has in Rwanda right now are the gorillas. That brings in all the tourism. There's only 360 left in the world. And we were spent uh, two weeks up there filming them. Yeah. And 
And so what are they doing? They're they having an area marked off for the gorillas. Now, is that is that because they've been hunted, the gorillas? Well, the, the gorillas only, these are mountain gorillas, not lowland gorillas like we see in zoos. There are no mountain gorillas in any zoo in the world. These are animals with real long hair, weigh 500 and something pounds, live at six to 8,000 feet in the mountains in very cool climates, 40, 50, low 50s, like in Las Vegas today, very cold climates. And uh, uh, they're an animal that's controlled by the big silverback, as you know, weighs about 500 pounds. And so uh, uh, these animals know to stay in their areas of the mountains. They don't come out of the mountains. And, and you got to be careful because the poaching up there are, are with snares to, to get bush meat, like to trap antelope. A lot of the gorillas get caught in them. So take me through like a typical episode. You'd go into a, a, a nation like Rwanda and do right. what? We, we go to a nation like Rwanda, get in our jeeps, travel up into the, the, the back country to a little village, get our guides there, uh, wake up in the morning about 3.30 a.m., start hiking up uh, to, towards 8,000 feet. Right. Uh, get up in there, and you're looking for the gorillas. Now, you only have eight groups. Eight, this eight is fam- what I need some hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you only have about eight families up there. So what you do is, you believe it or not, you follow this, the smell. The gorilla leaves a distinct smell uh, in their nest. They build a new nest every day on the ground, and then you, you know that nest is from the night before, and then they eat from about daylight till about 10 in the morning, and you hear them back in there eating, and then you approach them very, very quietly because they're habituated to you. In other words, they're not going to attack you like King Kong. Right. Uh, you just got to make sure you don't look them in the eye. For example, if you're a silverback gorilla, a big male, I'm like this all the time. I never look like this at okay. you in the eye. If you do, you're, it's threatening to them. Yeah, exactly. They'll come. They'll, they'll never attack anybody. But if you try to approach their babies, you, you never let them. You never approach them. They approach you. Right. And that's a typical day. We film the gorillas all day. I hike back down the mountain. We film some golden monkeys. We film a lot of uh, several of the reptiles there, and of course, talk to the people there. Have you ever come across uh, animals that you're not familiar with? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, right here, this town here. Yeah, I've heard you heard that joke before. But no, uh, sure I do, because you got to remember something. There are about 20,000 species of animals and plants that have never been discovered yet and will go extinct before they're ever discovered. Uh-huh. So, you know, I, it happens all the time. You know, I saw a cave crocodile in Belize, which I never even knew existed. It scared, the cra- it scared me to death. Uh-huh. Is there an animal that you have not, uh, you know, yeah. uh, seen. seen or a person come into contact with yet that you really wanted to? Right. You won't believe this. I went to Nepal to find Bigfoot. Right. And people laugh at me, all right? Uh-huh. They think I'm crazy. And? I took a helicopter up to 15,000 feet in the old, like in Indiana Jones, an old village that I really did three years ago. I stayed up there for three days. I almost died up there at 16,000 feet looking for Bigfoot. And they, they told me that Bigfoot, they have a Bigfoot. They have a big Bigfoot and a little Bigfoot. A little big, you know what Bigfoot is? Yeah. It's a uh, Satch Cat, you know, big Satch Cat, exactly. right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but you believe this, they said there's a little Bigfoot this big and a big Bigfoot bigger than we are. Right. And But I never saw him. But does anybody have it on film? No, I was trying, and that didn't okay. work either. Hey, uh-huh. look at this here. I got this in Rwanda. Look at that. Oh, okay. Look at this. Put your hand up here. I'll show you something. He won't bite you. This is not a centipede. This is a millipede. Okay. Look, at the, look at the legs. Yeah. yeah, look at the legs oh, on this thing. Jeez. Wow. Now, they do They do have cyanide. They eject. eject. Uh-huh. So do, don't put your... I'm not joking. Just oh, don't okay. put your finger in your eye. Uh, okay. Just wash it off. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's a millipede. It's garbage. I mean, the rest of us carry uh, keys and wallets, Jack. You carry... Uh, Oh, uh, millipedes, huh? cockroaches, everything. <laughs> I have a lot of fun with it. Hey, hey, well, good luck with Jack Hanna's Into the Wild. Well, thank you. And Thanks for uh, let's have a couple of hour shows and some half hour shows. That's right. You've right? seen them. We, just, we, don't, we, we, don't, we, we have several options right now, which is good to have, so we'll be letting people know here shortly. Okay, thank you very much, yeah. Jack Hanna. Next time you see a kangaroo, think of me. <laughs> well, I can't help it. <laughs>